Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 5th of November and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 8th of November with me Michael Hewson. It's certainly been an interesting week, there's certainly been plenty of fireworks um, for want of a better word, albeit a day earlier than normal with the unexpected decision by the Bank of England to leave interest rates on hold and while the reasons for leaving rates on hold were probably justified on the merits, the um, decision to do so actually came as a big surprise to markets in general. And I think that's, I think that's important because I think as Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey had the opportunity um, this week to change the perception, if you like, and I suppose the competence of the Bank of England when it comes to forward guidance. I think forward guidance is an important concept when it comes to monetary policy decisions. The Federal Reserve performs it fairly well. I mean, it's not foolproof, but nonetheless, I think it gives markets a decent insight into policymakers' thought processes when it comes to setting out the tram lines or the guidelines for monetary policy. And um, this week's decision by the Bank of England, I think, um, was a massive letdown in that regard. Um, it was extremely surprising that the Bank of England decided to pretty much perform a screeching U-turn, given the fact that Governor Bailey had briefed on more than one occasion in recent weeks that a hike was coming, obviously he didn't say when, um, due to rising inflation expectations. But the sudden tilt or the change of tone obviously caused markets to front run the possibility of an interest rate hike. Now, whether it happens this month or whether it happens next month or potentially in February, is neither here nor there. Previous to that, markets weren't pricing in a hike at all um, in the next six months. So the change of tone was important in terms of repricing the markets. Um, and in that context, I think, you know, what the Bank of England did yesterday was unforgivable. Now, the view by Andrew Bailey was reinforced to a certain extent by new chief economist Hugh Pill, although he did soften the comments a little bit, but they certainly didn't soften them enough to rein back market expectations that the Bank of England might well disappoint not only um, this week, but potentially this year. Um, you know, and what was more dumbfounding, I think, than anything else, was that having set this hair racing a few weeks ago, Bailey then voted to keep rates unchanged as well, with the statement only saying that a rate rise was likely in the coming months. Well, you know, when? You know, three months, six months, one year? You know, the events this week are a huge own goal for the central bank. It's already widely distrusted by the markets due to the unreliable boyfriend era of Mark Carney. Bailey had the opportunity to reset the narrative when he took over and restore the central bank's credibility and discipline on messaging. And on every conceivable measure, he's failed, he's bodged it. He's bodged it in a fashion of more Bill Bailey than Andrew Bailey, with all due respect to Bill Bailey, who I think is a very talented musician and comedian. But we don't want a musician and a comedian as central bank governor, we want someone competent. And I think, you know, in terms of future messaging from the Bank of England, it's going to be very, very difficult for markets to take them seriously when it comes to projecting their forward guidance. The signal to noise ratio in terms of forward guidance is going to have to go up by uh, a factor of five or ten. Never mind one ping only, Vesely. You're going to need two or three to signal um, potentially. Um, further guidelines for interest rate expectations and forward guidance. 
We've seen the pound fall, we've seen yields fall aggressively. And to, to my mind, that is a failure of policy on the part of the Bank of England. You know, we, he's, Bank of, you know Andrew Bailey says it's not his job to um, steer market expectations on interest rates. Poppycock, that's exactly your job. Now, and we can see from this chart here that we've seen a sharp correction lower, not only in the 10-year yield, but the two-year yield. On the plus side of that, though, the yield curve has steepened. So that, in the short term, should be positive for banks. We did see a big sell-off in the aftermath of the decision on Thursday, um, um, but um, we have seen a little bit of a rebound in the prices of Lloyd's and Nowhere's today. And, uh, and in amongst all of this, when you contrast what happened with the Bank of England, what happened with the Federal Reserve on Wednesday, it's chalk and cheese. You know, the Federal Reserve started, announced the starting of its tapering program, $10 billion a month of US Treasuries, $5 billion a month of mortgage-backed securities starting this month. And the markets didn't bat an eyelid because the ground had been prepared beforehand. You can criticize the Federal Reserve for being behind the curve. You can criticize them for any number of reasons, but what you can't do is criticize them on the basis of their guidance. Um, the decision basically went through fairly seamlessly. They did push back somewhat on expectations of a future rate rises, um, um, and the market took that pretty much in its stride, but they didn't do a screeching handbrake turn on what markets had been expected. The ground had been prepared quite nicely beforehand, and ultimately it's down for the central banks to keep markets fairly stable. Now on the plus side, and there is a plus side to all of this for the Bank of England, the FTSE 100 is actually um, gone higher since that decision was announced. And that really does tie in with my bullish scenario on the FTSE 100 going forward. We're certainly moving higher and we could have the potential to meet my end of year target by seven, of 7,400 over the course of the next few days. We've only got less than two months to the end of the year. My end of year target is 7,400. I'm increasingly optimistic that we could well um, head towards that target and potentially meet it in fairly short order. At the moment, when I look at stock markets generally, um, the, the outlook looks fairly positive. We've also seen new record highs this week from the German DAX as well, back above 16,000 and holding above 16,000. So, you know, things look fairly positive. We've gone above the previous highs and um, we could well continue to move higher. It's also been a positive week for US markets as well. The S&P 500, I mean, obviously that rise is looking increasingly parabolic, but ultimately for me, you don't stand in front of a runaway train. Um, you basically jump on board and hopefully jump off before it comes to a, a screeching, uh, before it hits the wall. But at the moment, we look as if we're going to continue to head higher. All the indicators at the moment are for very much buying the dips when it comes to stock markets. And it's been the NASDAQ more than anything that's been leading this move higher. Tech stocks have pretty much outperformed this week um, and, and look like they're going, going to continue to do so going forward. If we look at Asia markets, particularly the Nikkei 225, but in a slight underperformance there, um, that looks like it's going to continue to be the case. But what I would say is they've still got potential to go back to the range highs, the Nikkei 225, the range highs that we saw back in February and September. So what does that mean for currencies going forward? Well, certainly I think in terms of the pound, this week's events have been an absolute hammer blow to my bullish case. And obviously I've had to throw in the towel on that. I no longer think that the pound, um, the pound I think now has the potential for more downside risk than upside risk. The Bank of England is going to have to do an awful lot of heavy lifting to claw back any of that credibility that they basically carelessly discarded into the trash can earlier this week. More importantly, if we look at the sterling index, we've broken below these lows here. Uh, and that, you know, that bodes pretty poorly uh, in terms of the potential for future gains. Um, there, there's obviously the big sell-off yesterday. We've broken through the lows 
of the last um, last few weeks as well. Certainly in terms of um, cable, and the downside now look we're looking for a retest of these previous lows at around about 134.10. If that fails to hold, then we could well see further declines back to um, this level here which currently comes in around about 131.60. Certainly 130, 131.60 is the extent of any push lower um, or the bottom of this channel here if we break below 134. I would hope that that level would hold. Um, certainly I think the bullish case for sterling is looking incredibly shaky at the moment and I think the only saving grace that I would have for that is euro sterling and the ECB but even that now is starting to look increasingly shaky but having said that euro sterling has been in a range pretty much for most of the last six months and I would be surprised even if we do get further sterling weakness if we take out these peaks that we saw back in September of around about 86.50, 86.70 I still think that is confined to the range simply because even if the Bank of England is awful lot has lost a bit of credibility over the course of the past few days the ECB is not going anywhere either um, they're not going to be raising interest rates anytime soon and I'm probably not going to be raising them next year even if the markets are starting to price in the prospect that that might happen I can't see it myself okay so what are the key events that we've got to look out for over the course of the next few days well obviously um, there's been concerns about the Chinese economy in particular um, markets don't appear to be overly concerned about that. All the concerns about Evergrande appear to have disappeared into the mists of time. I have a feeling that at some point over the course of the next few days they may come back with a vengeance. But nonetheless, we've got a whole host of economic data um, coming out of China over the course of the next couple of weeks, starting with Chinese trade numbers. Um, and these have actually proven to be slightly more resilient in recent months, despite the disruption that we've seen at Chinese ports and the various lockdown restrictions that have affected an awful lot of the country over the course of the third quarter. We have seen recent weakness in retail sales numbers, which suggests that demand in the Chinese economy is continuing, you know, has, has slowed considerably. Uh, albeit it might start to pick up as we head into Q4. Now, as I said, we've seen a bit of a, an improvement in the China trade numbers, and I think a lot of the reasons for that have been as a direct consequence of the disruptions to global supply chains, meaning that retailers have brought forward their pre-Christmas order spend in, to in, in order to ensure delivery time, um, delivery in time for the Thanksgiving, Black Friday, and Christmas periods. Um, over the course of the next few weeks. In September, Chinese exports rose to a three-month high of 28.1%, while imports are imports slowed, almost halving from the September levels of 33.1 to 17.6. And I think that the reason imports fell was obviously largely to the various power cuts, production shutdowns in China's heavy industries during that month in response to the sharp rises that we've been seeing in energy markets which made carrying on um, producing um, those energy intensive materials much more well, economically unviable essentially so um, in terms of exports we're expecting to see um, a rise of around about 21.5 percent maybe potentially even more while import demand should rebound um, to around about 23-24 percent so those Chinese trade numbers should give us a decent bellwether into um, demand, external demand, as well as internal demand for, um, for the Chinese economy. Um, obviously, we've also got um, US CPI. Um, probably not so much of a concern now that the Fed has started tapering. And obviously, we have this afternoon's US payrolls report. Which is, a, which is a record this video I don't have sight of, but I would be very surprised if we didn't see a significant significant improvement on the 194,000 jobs that we saw added in September. I would expect to see an upward revision to that number, and I would also expect to see a decent improvement 
in the October numbers as well, given the fact that weekly jobless claims and continuing claims have come down week on week um, over the course of the past four weeks. And actually continuing claims now are only 400,000 higher than they were pre-pandemic when they were trending at 1.7 million. They're now, only, they're now trending at around about 2.1 million. So um, you would expect to see a significant improvement in the um, US labor market in, as a consequence of that. In terms of US CPI for October, expected to see a further rise in the headline number from 5.4% to 5.8%. Now, if US CPI for October comes in at 5.8%, as is being forecast, that will be the highest level since 1990. Um, while core prices are also expected to come in at 4.3%, up from 4%. In September, and a large reason for that will be once again um, uh, energy prices, food prices, and what have you. There is inflation coming through down the pipe as a result of rising energy costs and supply chain disruptions. So, uh, a really hot number there um, could also start to see the market or increase the pressure, shall we say, on the Federal Reserve to potentially speed up the process of its tapering program. And I think that will be where the next debate, where the next discussion starts to um, unfold. It won't be about a rate hike, it'll be about, well, it will be about the timing of the next rate hike and whether it happens in 2022. It'll also be around the timing of whether or not the Fed speeds up the termination of its asset purchase program. We've also got UK third quarter GDP, the first iteration of that. Now, recent, recent data would suggest that the UK economy has slowed in the third quarter. We did see a decent upward revision, upward revision to the second quarter numbers to 5.5%, which means that at the end of Q2, the UK economy was in a much better place than was originally thought. Now, obviously, Q3, we are going to see a little bit of a slowdown. Manufacturing, particularly new car production, was and is likely to remain a drag due to the various semiconductor chip shortages and maintenance shutdowns in the North Sea. But in terms of Q3, including the summer holidays, the school holidays, that should be reflected in a decent improvement in the index of services numbers, even though it hasn't been reflected in the retail sales numbers. So you would expect to see a decent level of GDP growth in the third quarter, but you're probably still going to see um, a slowdown from 5.5% to around about 1.5%. Certainly the monthly GDP numbers over the period do suggest that, that very slowdown. Um, and there is a risk that these numbers could disappoint to the downside on the 11th of November. That will be um, Remembrance Thursday. Um, but, but, but overall, if we, if we look at, if we look at um, the effect that um, a strong GDP number, not a strong, a strong CPI number, should have on the US dollar. Obviously, the narrative this week has shifted from which central bank is expected to hike first. Probably won't be the Bank of England now. It's more than likely going to be the Federal Reserve. Having said that, we could be sitting here a month from now, or just over a month from now, six weeks from now, talking about the fact that the Bank of England have decided to push interest rates up from 0.1% to 0.15%. Who knows? That's the real shambles from this week's events. No one really believes a word the Bank of England is now set to say, and any message will need to be amplified by a factor of 10 if they want to get their message across. Because essentially, um, they're going to get the reputation of the little boy who cried wolf. And ultimately, when there is, when they do want to get a policy message across, people just won't listen. And that's the real damage, I think, from this week's events. Anyway, let's bring me on to the um, company results and the numbers that I've got a particular eye on this week. While we've seen the FTSE 100 make a fresh 20-month high, um, We've also seen some fairly decent performances across the board from a host of um, host of companies this week who are currently being able to pass through price in, or pass on price increases to 
consumers with a very little effect on sales. Now, whether or not that will continue to be the case as we head into the Christmas period and beyond that is open to debate. But we've certainly got a couple of retailers this week that I've got my beady little eye on. And I'm going to start off with Marks and Spencers, which is a staple, has been a staple of the UK high street for um, for the last hundred years or so. So looking at Marks and Spencers, um, we've ha we've seen a number of full storms over the past few years. You know, ever since I've been reporting on markets, um, Marks and Spencers has been basically talking about turnaround plans with respect to its general merchandising business. Um, you know, and um, I don't think today or this week is likely to be any different. But one of its key crown jewels has been its food business. Its food business has done very well indeed. I think what the pandemic did do was it forced management to make some very difficult decisions with respect to some of its stores. And given the fact that company reported a decent set of numbers back in Q1, this is, is the, this. This week is MS's first half numbers. Given the fact they posted some fairly decent numbers back in August, and you can see that here when this move higher, um, expectations I think are quite high that they'll continue to deliver as we head into Q2 and do the uh, and basically do the first half. So the food division saw a rise of 10.8% on last year and 9.6% on 2019. Now, obviously a large part of the reason for that has been the tie up with Ocado. Um, that's really paid dividends for them. Uh, general merchandise has continued to be the laggard, but even here there are signs of optimism with sales only down 2.6% on 2019 levels um, in Q1, um, with a 92.2% improvement revenue wise from 2020. So Clothing and, home, clothing and home online sales were up 61.8% on pre-pandemic levels. So it's clear that they're going in the right direction. The outlook management expect to see profits before tax to come in at the upper end of guidance of 300 million to 350 million pounds. So they will nearly, they'll really need to deliver on that when they report later this week on the 10th of November. And if we go back, we can see that we're still um, below the highs of 2020. Um, and the big level for me is that 200p area, 210. If we can get back through there, uh, and by the looks of this chart, it's a big ask, but what I would say is that the, the lows are getting higher, then the potential is for the recovery plan to continue but we need to take out 200p to um, I think reinforce any confidence that this turnaround plan for Marks and Spencers is starting to bear fruit. Now looking at Associated British Foods and Primark you'd be forgiven for thinking that um, they're in a lot of trouble but when I actually look at the numbers for Associated British Foods and this is their full year numbers and they're due out on the 9th had a really poor year share price wise. I mean, we started back in December here. Yes, we're off the lows, the, pre, the pandemic lows of March 2020, where we've got big, big support. But over the course of the past 11 months, the share price after peaking in March and April has gone on a slow downward glide. Um, and it's been one of the worst performers this year on the FTSE 100. And these declines have come despite seeing a stronger than expected recovery in its Primark business. You need to remember that Primark doesn't have an online business. So when the shops were shut, there was no revenue coming in at all for Primark. But it does have other businesses. Um, Primark sales for the second half of this year are expected to come in at 3.4 billion, with operating margins expected to come in at over 10%. However, in the second half of the half, or the second quarter, or the last quarter of the half, like for like sales were 17% lower than they were in 2019. As the pent up demand effect that we saw in the reopening July, August, and September rolled back. Obviously, you also had the August um, various self isolation restrictions during Q4, which also hampered 
footfall at stores as well. So again, the lack of an online operation there hampered its recovery. Um, and we have seen improvements in food, sugar, um, and its agricultural business as well. So you would expect to see um, a little bit of an improvement and a much more positive outlook. And certainly the share price does appear to have found a bit of a base and perhaps this week's full year numbers along with more positive guidance for uh, full year 22 next year um, should give the shares an additional uplift as we head towards Christmas. Okay, moving on to AstraZeneca, um, 12th, of no 12th of November, seen steady gains in AstraZeneca shares. It's been sort of the, uh, um, it's been a little bit, I think it's been the ginger stepchild of the uh, vaccine companies a little bit. It's, um, it's, it's struggled relative to its peers, Pfizer and what have you, but it's going in the right direction. The Alexion tie-up has, um, has the potential to improve its finance. Its vaccine um, revenues are likely to increase. We saw an increase in vaccine sales of $894 million in Q2. Um, in Q3, that would be, that will hopefully improve now that AstraZeneca is starting to charge slightly more money for its Oxford vaccine. It was always provided at cost for the initial stages of the pandemic, but as new contracts are drawn up, um, they're sure to extract a slightly higher price for it, even if they don't charge $21 a dose, which is what Pfizer are charging for their own vaccine sales. I mean, if you look at Pfizer's vaccine revenue, um, it's $36 billion, or are projected to be $36 billion which is a huge amount of money. And when you consider that their total revenues for 2019 were $41 billion pre-vaccine, it gives you an indication of the money spinner that the vaccine has given companies like Pfizer, Moderna and BioNTech um, when it comes to selling um, their vaccine worldwide. Um, so seen some fairly decent gains, looking to potentially, we're, we're sort of the top end of the recent range over the course of the past um, over the past few weeks, and certainly the uh, AstraZeneca shares are looking to potentially test, retest the record highs that we saw all the way back in 2020. So certainly the direction of least resistance at the moment for AstraZeneca is very much towards the upside as Pascal Sorio continues to basically work his magic on the vaccine or on the on the AstraZeneca share price. Um, also got Coinbase. Um, quickly spin this out. Coinbase has continued to do fairly well, recover from its lows of early this year. Um, there is a concern, an overriding concern about the company's revenues going forward, because if, if the recent numbers from Robinhood markets are any guide, um, there is an expectation that these numbers could miss to the downside. Now, why did I say that? Well, despite the record highs that we've seen in Ethereum and Bitcoin, a collapse in crypto trading revenue on, in Robinhood suggests that while markets in crypto have been going up, people probably aren't taking part as much in the move higher. Now, Robinhood markets certainly may not well be a bellwether for the crypto market, but the fact that crypto revenues fell so much suggests that there may have been a trickle through effect into Coinbase and Coinbase don't have the option of trading any other markets. It's very much a crypto company. Um, so when Coinbase reported back in Q2, management were circumspect, quite rightly by the sounds of it, about their Q3 guidance. Um, an awful lot of the improvement that we saw in Q2 was driven by Ethereum trading. Well, obviously that has hit record highs, so we could well see uh, we could well see a significant boost there. Um, I think, in terms of Q3 profits, we're expected to see them come in at one dollar seventy-five a share, which would be slightly down on the expectations of Q2. Q2 profits were boosted quite significantly by one-offs, and if we look at, say, for example, revenues. 
um, in uh, Q2 or trading volumes, they were around about $462 billion. So trading volumes in Q3 could struggle in that context. Revenues in Q2 came in at just above $2 billion. So I think if they do equally as well in Q3, they'll be doing very well indeed. So Coinbase numbers are due out on Tuesday the 9th. And we're going to wrap this up with Disney. Um, its shares are trading at a very key support level, um, down from their March record highs and testing support at around about 165. Now, I think market expectations over Disney's third quarter numbers were high. And that was for several reasons. Not only was the company adding new subscribers to its Disney Plus streaming platform at a fairly healthy clip, but the start of summer also marked the reopening of its theme parks, holiday resorts, albeit operating with lower capacity constraints and higher costs. Nonetheless, they were able to beat expectations in Q3, um, coming in at $17 billion. Um, Parks division generated income of 356 million. However, and I think this is why the share price has weakened a little bit. Um, it's still, it was it, the company said it was still seeing disruption in its film and TV um, production, and the extra costs involved in this are expected to reach a billion dollars. You know, and that's quite a healthy chunk of change. Um, a range of new content helped Disney Plus beat expectations on new subscribers, 116 million, above expectations of 113. Q3 profits are expected to come in at 48 cents a share. Um, so I think the big question here for me is whether or not they continue to add new subscribers. Obviously, the Fox, um, the, additional, the addition of Star to the content library is probably going to help drive acquisitions there. Um, so I think the big question here is, um, with the with the onset of winter, um, do we see a little bit of a slowdown in theme parks or holidays, or with the reopening of US travel routes, do we see a pickup of travelers to European travelers to the various Disney resorts in Los Angeles and Florida? So it'll be interesting to see whether or not we get a bit of an upgrade on guidance due to an increase in vaccinated visitors from Europe and the UK for the winter months for the theme park operations. Okay, so I think I've pretty much um, covered everything that I wanted to in this week's weekly market update. Once again, I'd like to thank you very much all for listening. Wish you all a happy bonfire night or bonfire weekend. Stay safe with the fireworks, stay safe with the trading and have a great weekend. Thanks very much for listening.